Good evening, everybody. Greetings from Chennai International Center. The CIC, for those who are joining us for the first time, is a non-profit organization formed to promote exchange of information and ideas in the fields of education, business, finance, economics, arts, commerce, literature, law, science and technology, politics, public administration, social sciences, sports and culture. It was founded in 2016 and it was conceived by some of the city's accomplished industrialists and professionals with an objective of creating an intellectual hub for the city's intelligentsia to meet, share, discuss, and evolve transformational opinions. CIC aspires to be a spark for the mind and soul. We have close to 300 members, and we regularly invite accomplished Indian and global personalities to share experiences and vision in their respective areas of expertise. The center has a diverse and strong discussion of professionals, entrepreneurs, academicians, environmentalists, administrators, media persons, and historians who are dedicated to us contributing to shaping the economic, social, and political gradient of our country. Since its inception in 2016, the CIC has hosted more than 130 events. In fact, today is the 135th event of the CIC, and you are all welcome uh, to join us while we discuss Pradeep Chakravarti's latest book, Leadership Shastra. On the panel today are Sri Lakshmi Narayan. He needs very little introduction. He is, he very modestly describes himself as a computer professional, but he was the co-founder of Cognizant Technologies and he is currently working with startups. His keen interest is in higher education. He is the managing trustee of the Chennai Mathematical Institute and he is also the chairman of the ICT Academy. Welcome, Mr. Lakshmi Narayan. Thank you, The other panelist is Sri Garapati. He is the CEO and ED of Oriental Yeast India Private Limited. He is the founder of the Swayam Krishi Private Limited. He is also the founder of the Old Madras Baking Company and many other uh, such enterprises. He is an alumni of the Harvard Business School AMP program. He has a master's from the University of Buffalo. He is a sportsman, a traveler, a reader, and a member of the White Club. Welcome, Shrikar. Of Thank course, you. I'll leave Thank the introduction of the author to the panelists. So without further ado, let me hand it over to Sri Lakshmi Narayan to conduct the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chandra Mauli. And then let me add my welcome to all the participants the members of CIC. And uh, CIC has been a chosen platform for people to promote their books and launch their books. And this is one such occasion where the author Pradeep Chakravarti and his book Leadership Shastra is being launched, through promoted to the members of CIC and the larger community. Uh, it's, it's nice to have you here, Pradeep. First of all, congratulations on this effort on your ninth book, and I understand that there are, there are many more in the making. Congratulations, I hope you would continue writing. Uh, to discuss the book and the various aspects that he has highlighted in this book, uh, we have Sri Garapati, a brief introduction about him, was made by uh, Dr. Chandra Mauli. For those who know Sri Garapati, he is he's an entrepreneur, he's an investor, he's a leader, although his formal title or he derives his power and authority from the title of being the CEO and managing director of one of the companies, a very large company that's setting up a huge 800 crore plus plant uh, in Pune. He is known to many of us as an entrepreneur. You know, he has done a lot of work in the area of food, food processing and an average sports person. Uh, the reason why we consider him a good panel member and a person who can very eminently discuss this book is his entrepreneurial efforts and the role he plays with the Young Presidents Association. He has been a, I mean, that organization has taken a lot of help from him. He has coached and mentored many people as part of the OIPO, etc. So there isn't any other person who can do a better job of looking 
through the prism of entrepreneurship and leadership than Sri Garapati. And of course, he will talk about uh, Pradeep and his book. But I do want to mention that uh, Pradeep, I've known him for some time. I take great pride in saying that he helped build Cognizant as an organization during the time that he spent with us. Thank you. We continue to be grateful for those efforts, Pradeep. And he's been a consultant. And he's been an historian, a multifaceted personality. So I would now request Sri to introduce Pradeep in a little more detail and the book. And then thereafter, Pradeep will talk about the book. What prompted him to write that book? What is the type of research that he did in order to come up with all the life lessons and the leadership lessons that he quotes in the book? And then we will engage in a conversation. Thank you. And over to you, Sri. Thank you. Thank you, Lakshmi. And thank you to CIC and Pradeep for inviting me to be a part of this panel today. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it. So uh, let me give you a brief introduction about Pradeep. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Pradeep is a Chennai boy, or should I say man, born in 1975. Uh, Pradeep was educated in uh, KFI and uh, completed his college in uh, MCC, uh, Madras Christian College. And then he did his post graduation in uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Uh, and then he continued his uh, studies in uh, LSE in London, where he studied human resource development. And he's currently pursuing his PhD on the administration of the Pandya Kingdom. Pradeep began his career working in the family business, the TBS Group. He later worked at Cognizant, Infosys, and McKinsey. In all these organizations, he worked in HR and learning and development with clients to improve performance through behavior change. For the past few years, he specialized in conducting workshops, one-to-one -one coaching sessions and heritage tours that seek to impart leadership and life lessons from the Indian history and philosophy. So Leadership Shastra, the current book we are discussing, is his ninth book. His earlier books include one on Tanjavur, Kodaikanal, the temples of Tamil Nadu, and Ashok Leyland. His work on children's history of South India and a translation uh, work are currently in press. He lives in Madras with his 12-year-old car and cricket crazy son, uh, Raghavan, and his father. So that's the, that's the brief intro of uh, uh, Pradeep. Uh, but uh, let me, uh, I mean, you know, when Pradeep first called me and asked me to talk about this, so he sent me this uh, book, Leadership Shastra. And, um, and I think over the last uh, two weeks, I've been reading a few chapters as I've been traveling around the country. And it's fascinating to me how much we can learn, uh, even though it's historical, most of these leaders he's written about are uh, people from the 1400 to maybe about the 17th or 18th uh, century. Uh, but, you know, it's fascinating for me in how um, history and context can teach you so much, uh, so much about what, as business leaders, what we are going through today. And, uh, you know, as I was reading through this, uh, I, was, I was actually reflecting on my own experiences, on what I have learned from, uh, you know, uh, working in different uh, uh, fields and uh, different uh, continents. And uh, it's really history gives you a perspective. Uh, and uh, some of the things that I'd like to share with you, or at least introduce you before uh, I hand it over to Lakshmi is, uh, I think through these books, there are some common themes. You know, one is about purpose, purpose in life. And all these leaders had some mission or purpose and what they wanted to achieve. And, uh, you know, a lot of them forged uh, strategic alliances uh, to either influence or expand their empire or influence uh, certain decisions which is again, very, uh, you, know, uh, you know, current in our own uh, business life. Uh, either we acquire companies or we form strategic alliances to influence uh, uh, or shape our businesses. And the third more important thing was uh, in uh, trying to understand uh, the decision-making process. What led them to take certain decisions? Uh, I think it was fascinating to me that uh, uh, somebody like uh, Malik Amba, who's a slave from Africa, uh, who uh, founded Aurangabad. Uh, and there's an interesting story about uh, resilience, trust, and grit, and how he built up uh, uh, his uh, kingdom. So I think there are several fascinating stories as we uh, discuss this book uh, uh, today. 
will share with some insights and uh, I request now Lakshmi or Pradeep to walk you through some of these fascinating stories which are there in the book. Over to you, Lakshmi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sri. That's a, that's a nice introduction about the book as well as about Pradeep. This may be the right time to show to the audience the cover of the book, at least. I hope it is visible. I do encourage all of you to buy one copy. If Pradeep is not kind enough to send you all a copy and then read it, that'll be very, very nice, very interesting. So let me start, uh, Pradeep. So, I, I mean, I've known a different facet of you. You've been a consultant, most a consultant all your life. And now you're into coaching, you've undergone formal training. And of course, you've had some fantastic education in Jawaharlal Nehru University, London School of Economics, uh, et cetera. Uh, looking, what gave you the idea that you can look at Indian history through the prism of leadership, about coaching, about values, et cetera? And how did you go about collecting the information, put this book together? You know, it's, it's very interesting because as Sri mentioned, some of the choices that you've made about the powers that be, the Maharajas and the leaders that you have spoken about in the book are, I mean, covering very interesting areas. You mentioned uh, Malik Kambar, you talked about purpose, you, you talk about strategic alliances in the book. Just tell us what went into it uh, for us as well as for the audience. We're quite eagerly waiting to listen to you. Thank you, Lakshmi, and thank you, Sri, and, and uh, of course, the Chennai International Center as well. Um, in the last decade, I have been speaking at many occasions about how we can connect history to our day-to-day -day behavior and how we speak and think and act. Uh, as I speak about history in varied audiences, it could be in organizations, it could be uh, for students, uh, I find two responses to history coming up. One set of people believe that history is boring, it was irrelevant for them. I mean, why do I need to know X King lived from so and so time to so and so time? So there's one group of people who always told me they hated history because they thought it was boring and irrelevant when they learned it and they, they were compelled to learn it as a child. There was another group of people who love history because they love the stories around it. And, and at the end of the day, all of us human beings are in a way babies in big bodies. And we love stories and, and we, we connect to stories fast and we have that sort of people. But I felt many times in that case, it was more the ability of the teacher to tell a story rather than actually the story, the, the, the historical personality as well. My understanding and my connection to history was actually very, very different. Um, I was privileged enough to spend my summer vacations in my ancestral home, uh, which has been in our family for six generations. And the upstairs of the home, which was about five to 6,000 square feet, was filled with junk that belonged to these six generations. And, uh, and in that, I would spend many, many hours in summer, in, especially in the afternoons, rummaging through the things of, of textbooks and notebooks and papers and magazines and clothes and furniture, you name it, whatever was broken at home downstairs was dumped upstairs. And in one powerful visual really stood out to me, which was um, a math textbook or a notebook that belonged to some child of some ancestor of mine from the 1900s or the 1910s. Um, and it was filled with doodles in, a, in, in one of those old ink pens, yellowed pages, very different handwriting. And one of the doodles said, I hate math. Uh, and it connected very much to me because in one end, I could see a sentiment that was very similar to mine. And in another end, it, the context was completely different. The, the, the book, the, uh, the ink, the handwriting and everything. So it gave me a sense of how history can be similar or different depending on the lens that you look at it. And in my time in, in Cognizant, in, over the weekends, whenever I had time, I used to visit a lot of temples and look at temple inscriptions, which are writing on the wall. And, and as human beings, we never tend to look at the writing on the wall. And maybe we should, because in one particular temple in Thirumayam, which was not very far off from uh, Madurai, uh, was this lengthy inscription on both the Shiva temple and the Vishnu temple, which talked about a very, very bitter caste dispute with blood running on the streets and temples being broken and idols being flung into the river and so on and so forth. It became so bad that we had uh, the local king had to bring a Karnataka general to come and partition that village into two. He actually built a wall in the middle. If you were on one side, you had to move to the other side and vice versa. The land, the water bodies, everything was partitioned. But if you go to that village today, you don't see the wall. 
you certainly don't even see those communities and you see nothing but just a few goats and complete calm and peace and yet if you read the papers today you will find that we still fight over religion we still fight over a lot of divisions so in all of these memories i learned to understand that fundamentally human nature has not changed our needs and our aspirations are our, our thirst to be remembered which is what some people would call a legacy continues to be there today as it was in the past and i'm sure as it will be in the future so when i started looking at history from that angle of saying that yes of course the dates are important of course the chronology is important i mean at the end of the day i have a 13 year old son i want him to pass his history exams and he needs to memorize his dates for that but if we at our age or our roles if we can keep that part aside and we look at what could have been the needs and the aspirations and more important the fears that people worked with then it becomes very very relevant for us and i think we can get a lot of very tactical ideas for us to improve our performance at work so that's that's a long answer lakshmi to a short question of yours oh no that's that's great you know the, the important aspect that you mentioned that's very very interesting is it's curiosity you know rummaging through all that stuff there they are, i'm i'm sure several of the people before you would have just gone through that place and just ignored it but the curious mind is the one that looks for some of these patterns and tries to be curious by what can i do with that how did this come about etc and that's that's clearly one of the key characteristics of leaders this is that that's the type of curiosity and uh, let me uh, come to some uh, specific things that you talked about in the book of course i mean i'm i've i'm not a student of history i enjoy reading some of the stories of history i cannot say i know much about the history i did read the book and it was fascinating for the reason that you mentioned you know it is a it's a simple book it's not going into the chronology of the events that happened not too many characters very simple to understand etc and whenever people talk about the past uh i i always tell them it, it, even if it is in a celebratory manner i always tell them you know yeah let's celebrate the past but let's focus a lot more on creating the future but having said that there is so much that we can learn from the history from all these type of people who have come in and some of the stories i think there is one uh, specific thing that uh, sri mentioned about building institutions how institutions are built and uh, he quotes an example from your book maybe sri can just talk about it and uh, you can elaborate on that particular point sri yeah i mean yeah thank you thank you lakshmi actually i was fascinated by you know i think uh, there are so many historical uh, figures uh, cited in this book and uh, each one of them have contributed in some fashion or the other and the one uh, the, uh, lakshmi is talking about i was fascinated by the reading the history of the sikh gurus uh so i i think the institutional success of how what they achieved and they still uh, to this day they follow some of the processes that were established about almost 300 400 years ago like the langar system and uh, so it is it's quite a fascinating read all it takes is uh, uh one leader to have the conviction and uh, you know and to define the the you know what they want to achieve and uh, you know eliminating caste and uh, you know everybody coming in together uh, as one community so that was actually a very fascinating uh, read for me you know it was uh, i didn't know that history about the sikh gurus so i think uh, maybe pradeep you can you can you uh, can you just actually um, enlighten us a little bit more about how they built this uh, institution so so i want to take the sikh gurus with another chapter that i've written on shankar deva because you'll see a lot of connection and and i want to talk a little bit about chakra deva as well because one of the purposes of writing this book was also to bring about uh, a not so mughal centric history as as many people believe india is today chakra deva was a very important poet saint in assam uh, i've not looked at a lot about his religious work i've looked more at how he brought a lot of people in assam together and if you even in the sikh gurus chapter i've just looked at the first five sikh gurus i've looked at nanak i've looked at uh, angan uh, angad i've looked at amardas uh, ramdas and of course arjun dev as well if you look at these sikh gurus one thing that stands out now in in the sense of being remembered 
they've left a legacy that has been long enough for the sea community to be a very entrepreneurial or uh, enterprising a very close knit community which is very proud of their identity even today so the very fact that their legacy has survived for such a long time should interest those of us who want to leave a long term legacy either in the individual work that we do or in the companies that we tend to work with or tend to create now what could be certain things that the sikh gurus have done at least the five sikh gurus have done and you will see a remarkable parallel in what shankar deva did as well the first thing that they seem to have done well is they have set a personal example if you look at the work that nanak did or or uh, angad did in terms of the food that they ate the, the preachings that they said if they preached about the the importance for equality of people to live together to work together to dine together they practiced it themselves shankar deva does the same thing he is able to and i think for shankar deva he also goes through a lot of difficulty in his early life in losing his wife and having to travel and that seems to bring him in contact with a lot of people who are not as privileged as he is and you can see that same pattern in the sikh tradition as well the second thing that the sikhs uh, the sikh gurus do is they take that really tough choice which i think uh, indian businesses especially because especially indian business many of them are family owned businesses it's a very difficult choice to, when it comes to succession planning do i put the needs of the organization above me or do i put the personal needs of which of my children is my favorite or which who i think is the best to lead do i leave it to the board or do i take that decision myself do i leave it to the stakeholders the larger stakeholders or i take that decision in the sikh tradition they don't seem to have wavered at all it's always been by merit and you'll see especially in the first five because um the first five had to deal with the well akbar was not that much of a difficult to deal with but jahangir was an extremely difficult person to deal with um and and if they were able to keep their the their identity of being the sikh religion intact it was largely because the ground was set in the first five uh, gurus and all of them tended to choose by merit and you will see in the stories in fact i have not covered a lot of their biographical areas but i have taken care to mention that none of the sikh gurus were actually related by birth to each other at least the first five uh, and that seems to have been something that's important that was done uh, shankar deva didn't do that it that much but he did something that the sikh gurus also did very well which was they did multiple things to bring the people's emotions together what did they do uh, the first thing that they did was in terms of bringing them to eat together and pray together uh the longer as you mentioned and you will see that in the shankar deva tradition as well that the, he built these these uh these buildings where people were encouraged to come and pray together so the sense of community the sense of meeting together was an important thing so this may be a lesson for some organizations which might which might actually be veering towards let's work from home completely all the time because i don't know whether human beings will over a long period of time continue to have these strong bonds of relationship if work from home continues indefinitely i think we need that sense of community building that coming together number one the second thing that they did was they brought in music now maybe there will be some leaders who will think totally off the charts and and start looking at how their employees can unite by singing together by doing jam sessions but clearly both shankar deva and the sikh gurus used music a lot because music tends to connect people emotionally and that was a very important thread it was not just physical connection but emotion connection as well um the third thing that the sikhs particularly did was they always led by example i mean imagine at that time and age when when the mughal world was already a, a fairly important political and economic threat to the sikhs whether it was akbar who was a little bit more partial to the sikhs or jahangir or aurangzeb who was certainly not um getting um a uh, meer mia or a, a, a muslim saint to come and consecrate or open or, or start the building for the golden temple is a remarkable achievement even by today's standards and they all the time you will see in in the stories that i have mentioned that they always practice what they preach and therefore they were able to build a close followership and it mattered a lot especially when they went to people who did not feel respected in their regions and when those kind of people and you'll see that in shankar deva as well when the poorest to the poor the most downtrodden the ones who are inflicted with these dreadful diseases if they felt respected by these leaders 
then automatically that followers should happen. So I think the question for our leaders today and for myself is when I speak to others, what can I say? What can I do so that they feel respected the way they want to feel respected? And I think this is this would be my my sense of at, at a at a ten thousand feet level. What did Shankar Deva do, and what did the Sikh gurus do that makes sense for us to build followership and to build a lasting legacy and build a sense of common identity and community? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a terrific uh, the way it is being covered. The Sikh gurus and building a sustainable institution is a phenomenal thing. It just lasted over several centuries. Of course, it's uh, I mean other religions have. But the simple manner in which it was built is well narrated in the book. The other thing, the I mean, the one that I'm most fascinated by is Ahilya Bai, the lady. I mean, it's a it's an amazing story. It's an amazing story of a lady who created Indore, who ruled uh, much of Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, etc. From her new capital in Maheshwar. I think just before we started, we were chatting with Chandramouli. He was talking about the the palace in Maheshwar. Uh, I mean, if you, if you get a chance to visit that place, it's well worth a visit because it's a it's a great fort. It's a it's a very very simple palace from where she ruled, but the view from there is phenomenal on the banks of the river Narmada and the amount of work that she has done in terms of uh, uh, building temples, dharmshalas, etc. And she is she is one clear example of distinguishing between what my my friend Anu Oza would call the difference between authority and leadership. Okay. She had no authority vested in her. It was not as though she had a title. She was not the queen. She was the daughter-in-law of a king, Malar Rao Holkar. He was married to the Holkar family. She herself comes from a relatively ordinary background, but circumstances. Made her take up responsibilities that were far beyond what she was trained for, and she executed them in an exemplary manner. You know, and she didn't have any authority. People started following her naturally because of what you mentioned: their behavior, the way she behaved, the values that she espoused, the beliefs that she had, and uh, she is an example for innovation because she started and created these arts and crafts and the Maheshwari. Saris are famous even today. She had poets coming and uh, singing both praise of her as well as of the Lord, and so many different things that we did that she has done. I mean, in, in, in today's context, if you were to compare, there are uh, in similar people who have gone through such difficulty. I can I can think of someone like an Anu Aga, uh, who was Thermax. I mean, many of you would be familiar with Thermax as a company. Uh, her husband uh, was running it. He passed away. She had to take charge of that company and run it because soon after her husband passed away, she lost her son, twenty-five-year-old son. You know, amidst all that grief, she ran that organization and built it into something very, very substantial. Not because she understood the technology, not because of the engineering. That's a engineering and environment, Bharat. Uh, but because she had the values, she had the belief, and uh, she just displayed those values in her everyday, every minute behavior that people followed, and she she turned out to be one of the twenty five richest women in India, and uh, so on and so forth. And now, of course, she's dedicating all that to to charity, those type of work. So these are these are leaders, and of course, here I mean. In Chennai, we have Arthi Agaraj, and a person who created the Sri Ram Group as an empire, a symbol of simple life, created such a huge empire, but just standing as an example. So Ahilya Bai is somebody that you know I am a firm devotee of. Could you talk about that a little more? You have covered it fairly in depth, but then I'm sure there are a lot more stories about her that will fascinate every one of us. Thank you, Lakshmi. I, I would like to talk about two other things that Ahilya Bai did. I think you you've covered her story very well, and, and uh, she was she became a queen at uh, the age of eight or nine, and she became a widow at the age of twenty nine. And uh, it is it is said that uh, she was actually uh, there was a possibility that she might actually commit sati, but her father in law prevented her, which was a great uh, event because. If that hadn't happened, we wouldn't have been able to speak about Ahilya Bai Holkar at all today. 
Uh, two things that I see that she has done very well in connection with what you already said, Lakshmi, is she actually made that choice. I think she at that time she had the choice to either live life as a widow or or commit suicide or you know fade away into the ages of history or make whatever mark she could in a very very male dominated world, which continues to be very much the reality even today, whether in, okay. inside organizations or outside in the community. Uh, I admire her ability to work with men who supported her because. She couldn't have become applied to the Peshwa and, and asked for the uh, for the queenship without the help of the Peshwa's authorization and without the army protecting her. I mean, it's all very well for me to want to do this, but if I don't have the team or in those days the army, they could make or break the, the future of the uh, the uh, of a ruler. And she was able to do this. And when she did this, one thing that she does very well about her administration is a very ancient practice that was pra- that is prevalent across India when kings used existing networks of temples to actually further the um, the, the uh, social indexes that we think of as important today. Um, today, we tend to see temples primarily or exclusively as religious institutions. But in the past, they certainly were very minor, only were they in religious institutions. They were largely social and economic institutions for the welfare of the community around and it made perfect sense for a king to do that because a queen like Alia Bhai, especially in a place like Malwa, which is the region that she ruled, which is even today very, very thickly forested, moving from one city to another was impo- was pretty much impossible. It would have been very time consuming and extremely dangerous as well. And something that was more sustainable was to make each temple in each village or town or city to be an important economic and political um, uh, uh, representation of the ruler and dispense with whatever the whatever we continue to expect from the government. And she did that very well. The other thing that she did was, I think she kept a very, very careful watch on the top line and the bottom line. So if you look at the way she dealt with the Beals and the Bone and the tribals in that region, uh, she was able to work out a deal with them where they would be able to help her in terms of ensuring safe passage of trading goods because that's what the traders would have asked. And if she didn't have traders in the community, she wouldn't have had enough wealth because agricultural wealth can only get this much. It was tolls and taxes which would support the economy of the of the kingdom. And she was able to strike a deal with them. And I actually wanted to read a little um, extract about the way she thought of in, uh, her administration. Uh, so Malcolm, John Malcolm writes, about 40 years after she died, he writes, her first principle of government appears to have been moderate assessment and an almost sacred respect for the native rights of village officers and proprietors of land. She heard every complaint in person, and although she continually referred cases to courts of equity and arbitration and to her ministers for settlement, she was always accessible. So strong was her sense of duty on all points connected with the distribution of justice that she represented as not only patient, but unwearied in the investigation of the most significant cases when appeals were made to her decisions. So she she seems to have been a great listener, a person who genuinely looked at a win-win for not just her, the other parties, but also in the long term of the entire community. Today, we tend to talk about win-win between two human beings. I think in, in that context, it was not just the human beings, but the land and the nature and the ecosystem as well. And Alia Bai Holkar seems to have done that very, very well. So in the chapter, I've also mentioned the importance uh, it, for us to look at not just successful leaders, but people who have made them successful. And in Alia Bai Holkar's story and in the story of many other women leaders, and unfortunately, they're not as many in the book as I would like them to be, uh, it is a certain important myth. But likewise, in the story of Sarfoti II of Punjabur, when I've looked at what he has done and, and how he could be a remarkable leader for us in terms of just the lockdown and how we manage the lockdown, they were the queens of his uh, his ancestor who really worked hard in petitioning the British government to enter the Sarfoti contract. So, so just as, just as um, every successful leader's story needs to be looked at, we also need to look at the, the people who made that person successful. And, and like I've said, in a personal example, um, it may not be just the spouse or the or the teacher or the mentor or the boss. It could be somebody as humble as a driver or a cook who helps them come into the to the office space 
with a smile on their face. So, so those are some examples from Alia Bai's uh, life. Um, I think I struggled with finding many other stories like this, and even in Alia Bai Holkar's life, uh, because of something that anybody who has some love for Indian history needs to feel very worried and sad about, and hopefully do something about, it, which is. Um, the traditional way in which Indian history has been remembered is our oral history. Uh, and especially in the, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, we've lost generations, generations of people, especially the ballad singers and the, and the storytellers. And with those stories, we've also lost a lot of important leaders that we've, of whose stories we've lost. And, uh, People like Shivaji and Alia Bai Holkar, we would have had so much more of information if those oral histories had been uh, had been preserved. But fortunately, we have a little bit, and uh, therefore, I think it behoves us to do something uh, to make to make uh, a positive impact around us, at least with whatever little we have. Absolutely, I mean that's a, a fascinating story. Uh, we were more fortunate because it happened during the uh, the 17th century. Uh, better kept records, etc. I just want to add one more point about the Halya Bai before going to the next one. That's about, this is something that uh, her great-grandson talks about. I mean, it's available on YouTube. Uh, for all the things that she had done, uh, people used to just love her, look up to her as God because she built that Somnath temple, Kashi Vishwanath temple, uh, guards in Varanasi, etc. Uh, a poet wanted to meet her uh, persisted on meeting her and said, and of course, you would know that Pradeep is uh, smiling. So you wanted to meet her and uh, read out a poem in praise of her. After some time, she allowed him to do it. After that reading was over, she took him in a boat in the Narmada River and in full sight of the poet, she dropped that poem into the river and said that, thank you very much. And his great-grandson just says it in a very, very simple manner. He says, Ahilya Bai worked for impact, not for image. You know, it's a, it's a very, very telling story of how simple what humility means. That's a, you know, that's a, I mean, it's just for that chapter, I think I'll pay the price of the book. Now, <laughs> just, uh, Lakshmi, if I may add uh, on sure, Ahilya Bai, sure, I think... Ahead, uh, yeah. And like you said, right? I mean, I think uh, so. The one takeaway for me reading that story was about purpose. And uh, actually, uh, uh, I think uh, Pradeep mentions this. You know, she she had a real, uh, very clear idea on the concept of dharma and how she wanted to, you know, uh, take care of people and what she wanted to do. And I was just relating to it uh, to our own stories as uh, business leaders, right? I mean, I think we have an overall purpose of obviously. Uh, taking care of all our stakeholders and all that. But this this question of purpose of organizations, just beyond uh, business profits and our employees and stakeholders, I think, you know, we are, we are beginning to see this in this entire new moment on sustainable, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, building sustainable companies and, uh, you know, with climate change coming in. And uh, our uh, purpose in life uh, clearly is evolving. Uh, not just to building our businesses, but also to take care of the communities and to take care of, uh, you know, all these uh, new uh, sustainable uh, challenges we are having. So I think that was the big takeaway from me for that, from that story of Ahalya uh, Bhai. So. Yeah, and yeah, very, very nicely put. But also, I mean, you're from that territory, Maharashtra, Pune, I'm sure you're spending a lot of time. That is Shivaji Kingdom. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're, uh, so you're, you're fascinated by his leadership. Come on, yeah, so you yeah, must yeah. talk about Shivaji and then I'll have to be yeah. for you. See, it, it, I, actually, it is so interesting reading about uh, what Pradeep has written about Shivaji. And, and, you know, in every single action of that he describes in there, I found something fascinating. And I mean, it's some of the things that like understanding the landscape, geography and, uh, and the terrain. And, you know, because he's from that area and he used that to his uh, advantage to, uh, to, uh, to, to rule over, over that kingdom, right? I mean, you know, he, he, had, he fought a lot of wars with the Mughals and, uh, you know, and, and uh, so that was an interesting, fascinating. And as business leaders, all of us really need to understand the landscape we operate in. The second uh, thing was uh, he, he talks about the speed of execution. 
right? I mean, and that's so important for all of us, right? I mean, we can have uh, big strategies laid out and uh, vision, mission, uh, value system uh, defined for the organization. But the key is the execution. And in, in Shivaji's case, he used a very light cavalry, which, uh, and he, he would, uh, you know, and that allowed him to travel at a uh, breakneck speed and, uh, you know, and execute his strategies. And he never shied away from adapting any of these strategies. So, you know, if he had to retreat, he retreated. Uh, and that was a, a, another interesting thing, which I thought we could all relate to as, uh, as business leaders. And uh, he built relationships with all the uh, villagers. So that actually helped him a lot, uh, you know, uh, when he was, uh, when he had to retreat and hide and these villagers helped him a lot uh, in fighting these wars. And the other fascinating thing about not just uh, Shivaji, but a lot of the, the, the stories that are mentioned in this is about the teams that these leaders built. Often, uh, you know, history, we talk about uh, uh, Shivaji, we talk about all the kings and uh, the leaders that ruled uh, any of these, uh, you know, lands. We forget the foot soldiers who really helped them in achieving their goals, right? I mean, in, in the case of Shivaji, it was Tanaji, who was his good friend, who really contributed a lot. He was Senapati, and he fought so many wars for Shivaji. And also the, the foot soldiers and the villagers who helped him in, in so many of these. So I think, uh, you know, it's, it's fascinating to me. And not just in Shivaji, you know, this building the teams and building and having, uh, you know, uh, communicating your vision to your team and uh, making them uh, coalesce around a strategy was an important lesson that uh, I learned uh, reading the chapter on Shivaji. Pradeep, your comments about Shivaji? Well, it's, it's difficult not to say anything negative about Shivaji. So I have to be really careful there. In fact, I've actually said that. You know, there's so much of good stuff that it's, it's quite dicey to even say something negative. But I'd love to compare Shivaji with somebody whom we may not have a lot of time to go into depth with, which is Lachit Borpu Khan. Borpu Khan is an Assamese word to mean a general. And Lachit was just as smart as Shivaji was in terms of knowing the terrain and in being in... Well, Shivaji was a thorn in the flesh uh, for uh, Aurangzeb. Lachit was another thorn in the flesh for Aurangzeb as well. Uh, and uh, his battle of Saraigat is something that Shivaji would have certainly approved of. So Lachit kind of focused on a narrow stretch of the Brahmaputra. So he knew that the larger, the heavier armies or the navies of the Mughals could not come. And even if they came through that little narrow part of the Brahmaputra, they will be they were easily uh, they could have been preyed at. And he apparently relied on uh, a physical phenomena. Now, I'm, not a, I'm not a physics expert, so bear with me if I don't say it the right way. If a heavy object is, is fairly immersed in water, it tends to create a tension so that lighter objects tend to navigate towards it. So what Lachit did is using the Mughal, heavier Mughal ships, his boats with the archers were actually on lighter boats. So they didn't have to work hard to go closer to the Mughal ships. And they were able to, using the power of the archers, the bow and arrow, they could decimate a lot of the Mughals, and which is why the Sarai Ghat, after Sarai Ghat, Aurangzeb had to sue for peace. So coming back to Shivaji, um, you can see the sense of understanding the geography, the sense of building a personal connect, the sense of knowing when to give up. And I think Shivaji was very good at We tend to see Shivaji as this brave man who always fought against the Mughals. But actually, sometimes he didn't. He was very happy telling Aurangzeb, look, you're the boss, I'm the subordinate, and I live that way. But he bided his time very carefully. And it reminds me of, of, a, of a leader that, that uh, was very close to my heart, who spoke about how um, it is during times of recession that uh, his success happened when he tended to invest more heavily in people and, and internal uh, of, uh, procedures. Because he said, that is the time that we need to really look inwards, focus on the input, so that when the market opens up outside, we are ready to, and raring to go. And I think Shivaji seems to have really done that well. Um, but it also, it was difficult for Shivaji in a way that he had to work with a geographical environment, which was very harsh and arid most of the time, um, because he was not able to consolidate as well as he would have wanted to. And I think that's one, one thing that he could have done better. But that apart, I think from the many things from Shivaji that we could learn, and I, and I maybe should be spending more time because I think Shivaji Jayanti is either today or yesterday. Uh -huh. But suffice it to say, I think, Sri, you spoke a lot. Um, with Shivaji, I think what stands out 
is his ability to build a connect with his people and definitely mm-hmm. being very active in nimble and and i have seen personally in large organizations when they tend to become bureaucratic when it's even even a small thing like engaging a consultant to come for one day and for a training program the reams and reams of forms that need to be filled out i think when that sort of thing happens um that should be the 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 reminder that we are going the mughal way the aurangzeb way not the shivaji way or the lachit board ko kaam pe yeah oh, that's very that's a very nice comparison you know for the <laughs> audience they'll be wondering we are talking about shivaji as though we knew them so well we are talking about chatrapati shivaji maharaj at least for record we should make yeah. sure <laughs> that they, that is uh, addressed at least once respectfully <laughs> there's also a comment from uh, one of the one of the persons in the audience mr bharat ram he says it's just a question uh, to which i'll add my questions also he's talking about uh, what made you focus on the the period the 14th to the 17th century why not earlier periods uh, you know uh, and including the the chola sera pandya periods where there is a lot more to be learned from that that's one as to why you chose that and my own question was if you look at what was happening around the world at that point in time between the 14th 15th to the 17th century uh, it wasn't as though only in our subcontinent there were all these skirmishes battles wars and fight for territory etc uh, it wasn't as bad uh, in europe because europe was the the trading capital during those days venice greece etc but they were a lot more uh, adventurous people they were voyagers people like vasco da gama bartolomeo dias uh, ferdinand magellan during that period they set sail and came to india went to the west indies west, went to east indies but in our history even during that period when that was happening elsewhere in the world we don't see too many seafarers too many adventurers is 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 there is it because we were so busy the various kings and monarchs were fighting each other that they didn't have time to, to think about trade routes etc what is it that uh, you learned from the history study of history so so let me answer bharatram's question first um it just happened this way that most of the people were taken from this part uh i wanted to certainly pick leaders who at least most of the leaders who people would have understood or readers would have understood because essentially while i would love people who li- like history to also read this book this book is essentially for people who may not have such a positive view of, about history uh which meant it was important that i do focus on some well known names because otherwise it becomes very forbidding for a first time reader to you know read uh, 15 people who he or she does not know about at all so i put in all the some of the famous names at least um i would have loved to have done a few more from the earlier parts sometimes there was difficulty in getting uh, getting more information to flesh out the story uh, but i'm i'm really hoping that my commissioning editor is on this call because these are both excellent ideas for future books <laughs> and uh, and that is in truth that is really the case because um the number 15 was arbitrarily chosen in fact i can tell you there were some essays that i was personally very very fond of there's one on orissa that didn't make the cut uh, and we will keep it for another book but uh, i didn't want to keep this too south india focused because um uh, because it is in a way my comfort zone and i wanted to move out of my own comfort zone uh, i wanted to keep it certainly i wanted to include something from west india and eastern india because we don't get to hear so much about it uh, but i'm sure that future books will definitely cover a lot of these lacunae and, and uh, lakshmi to answer your question we certainly had many many enterprising traders and and uh, my phd thesis is is full of trade the trade guilds how they supported the community the warehousing pattern that they had the way they moved their goods the kind of military protection they uh, they had for their uh, for their trade goods and i can i can tell you that any any expert in the logistics trade today can learn a thing or two about how the traders worked in the pandya the chola period and of course the chera period as well uh, but we don't find many names of traders at that time because we tended to work as a guild and also because we were producing the luxury goods uh, the the world wanted indian goods much more than the indians wanted the world goods so they had to take a greater effort to come and meet us rather than the other way around um, but certainly uh, in a future book 
I would love to branch off into international history as well, but I thought I should focus, start from home and then go outside. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that's a good point. I think during the earlier periods, we had all these people. In fact, people from the south of India have gone to Malaysia, all those places, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, pretty much discovered by us. It's, but having said that, we've had that, I think you also covered that. Uh, and this again speaks to the, to the leadership again, women leadership, Jahanara, Shah Jahan's daughter, came, not vested with any authority or power. It was not as though she was the, the queen. She was, yes, she is a princess. Uh, and she was a leader in her own right. She, people would go to her to solve problems. If they had any problem with Aurangzeeb, in order to settle that, with Shah Jahan, the go-between person was Chahinara. She was respected. She earned that reputation. She earned that through her skills, through her beliefs, through her leadership abilities. And she is the one who is credited to have done the most trading in a very profitable manner with the Dutch East India Company and the British East India Company. Very profitable. And of course, she in her own right created that uh, Chandini Chowk you know, architecturally. That's a place. And she is another great woman leader that you have profiled in your book. And that, her story is also a fascinating story. True. And I think one, and you, you mentioned a lot of the, the good things that need to be said about her. And, and truly, I think one thing I would have loved to have, you know, been the fly on the wall as I saw Jahanara would have been her remarkable ability to build alliances with men in her life who are viciously fighting each other. It's one thing to talk about a boardroom struggle or, you know, a boss and a subordinate not getting along. But brothers and father you know, all ready to chop off each other's heads. And, and you know, we, we've had a very fearful story about Shah Jahan, but if you look at what Shah Jahan wanted to do to his brothers, um, he shouldn't have been very surprised that Aurangzeb was trying to do this to him. <laughs> so in spite of a group of men like this, a woman in the Mughal court, in, in a court which does not give a lot of uh, eminence to women, uh, her ability to build an alliance with, and, 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 I've, uh, and I've written a lot about Aurangzeb. In fact, that's the chapter which has the maximum number of references in the bibliography. Because I wanted to be sure Aurangzeb is such a reviled character. For a man like Aurangzeb to actually accept that she was the number one woman in his court itself, speaks a lot about what she was, the kind of personality that she was. Um, and in, in, in the context of her connection with the traders of the Dutch and, and the English, um, I think it is well possible that it was one of those powerful connections, of course, with the help that the Dutch got from their own government, that enabled the Dutch to kick the British out of the trade spices in, yeah. in the Southeast. And because they lost their trade in the Southeast with spices, they said, what is our next best opportunity? It happened to be textiles. And that's how they, their imprint in, in, uh, in India became much larger. So maybe if Jahanara and the Dutch had fought very differently, the British would have continued to have worked in the Southeast Asia and maybe not come into India for our textiles so much. And, and, as, a, and as a result, the economy of Mexico would have been very different because it was the textile trade in India that uh, made Mexico's textile trade collapse as well and they moved on to other businesses as well. You can see Indian, the business is connected in very different ways. And Lakshmi, just one more point in, in to your possibly, I'm thinking aloud here, we probably don't get to hear of famous Indian traders, not just because we were supplying more than, you know, we were, we were much more in demand. I think it's also when you look at inscriptions in South India, you don't get much information about North India traders because we've lost those inscriptions. Inscriptions in the South from Kerala, Andhra, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu, but largely Tamil Nadu and Kerala. The trading community was largely very, very guild driven. So it was more a group of traders which was important rather than an individual trader. In fact, even when we find mentions in South India of the trade guilds or traders giving um, something to the temple, which they did in the same logic that Ayala by Holkar did, we know more about the guild rather than individuals. So we seem to have had a very, uh, very conscious system in the trade guilds of not emphasizing on one particular leader, but truly working as a very functional team with, with, uh, with very close connections rather than one leader doing the job. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I mean, the point that you mentioned about uh, Jahannara building strategic alliances, that's, that's, very, uh, that's, that's very telling uh, for a woman to go out and uh, be there, diversify. Uh, fantastic. Sri, your comments on that? 
on the strategic yeah, alliances I, <laughs> i think that was a common theme among a lot of the 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 the, the, the kings that are described in this book right i mean all of them actually uh, uh, interestingly at times uh, to protect their kingdom uh, or to expand uh, their uh, sphere of influence uh, they uh, they actually uh, got into alliances with other kingdoms so it's you know it is a common theme uh, just to uh, i mean I, i just want to i know we don't have much time i just wanted to uh, touch on something else that is there in the book which is nothing to do with the leaders but it's uh, what pradeep gives as insights right i mean because of his experience and you know in the introduction of the book and when he writes about certain things one of the things that struck me because you know that, that's that's something that i can relate to as well is uh, something called bias creep we are all um, we all have our own experiences and our thoughts and uh, ideas are shaped by what we have gone through and we have our own prejudices and i was thinking you know there are meet sometimes meetings where i walk into thinking i know the answer to this what's the outcome of this meeting is going to be <laughs> so and he warns us against these kind of bias creeps right just go in and with an open mind uh and uh, not not to have uh, uh prejudged decision making so i think that was another important lesson i learned from uh, you know just his uh, forward or the introduction he wrote in the book so i think uh, Yeah, I mean, that, that's an interesting point. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Pradeep, go ahead. I was just going to so that to that point. See, uh, and I've said this in the book. This book is not about how should history be taught in schools, which is the right way to look at history. Because at the end of the day, history or humanities in general is about people, and uh, every person can look at the same thing and look at it very differently. It's not. It's yeah. not like physics or math or chemistry where one plus one will always be two in whichever yeah. country in whichever generation. humanities yeah. is going to be different so i actually faced a lot of difficulty in in the aurangzeb chapter uh because he is a very reliable leader but he, you have to give him his due um today in every organization geographical spread is a really important parameter whether it's a, it's in terms of the number of offices you have across the world the number of clients you serve is across the world uh, it's the number of stores that you might have across a geography geography is important and among all the mughals the mughals are a great empire because of aurangzeb and uh, when we are talking about leadership by example with the guru nanak and shankar deva aurangzeb practiced what he preached uh, imagine a leader being so frugal so careful about the the finances at a time when they could have actually spent a lot of money so it was very difficult for me and i had to very very carefully look at both the right wing and the so called left wing and then present the case and, and there i find if we single mindedly read history for how can this help me improve my performance at work or in relationships mm. then i think the lenses become very and we will take the bias because all of us are biased in some way or the other to something or the other but it's it's about getting to know that bias and then acting from that which is yeah, not easy absolutely. but hopefully that's why people keep looking at leadership stars the ones that are going to be great <laughs> that's interesting i think as we approach the uh, the final minutes of this I mean, this just one last topic that i want to touch upon which is more bringing it to the the current situation the current leadership the current focus the new leaders who have emerged uh i mean for for people like this is something that uh, we can draw from the book also for people like tipu sultan uh, failure is not an option i'll have to keep fighting i'll have to keep fighting whereas in today's context a person like elon musk says failure is an option i would like people to fail because if you don't fail we are not innovative enough we are not challenging ourselves and and uh, the some of the comments that he makes you know he, he says if i get up every morning and if i don't think about how many planets like earth would the universe have lost in the past either due to warming or due to not understanding science properly etc could the same thing happen to us this planet earth before that happens should we not be prepared and should we not have at least a colony in some other planet and have life so there, there there are people who think about a lot more about the future and what is i mean that's that's because science and technology has advanced we are able to think about it like that and it's it's not as though it's new it's uh, even people like uh, madam curie when she, she received the nobel prize she she talks about you know what we have done in the past is is a minuscule but what lies ahead is the greatest thing that we have to focus on 
so that kind of a leadership is something that we are all transitioning into in the current situation people are becoming a lot more innovative risk taking etc and i'm sure there are examples of people who did that during that period of time because there are examples in europe i mean scientific discovery like like cavendish or galileo or copernicus these are people who were around the same time uh, thought differently thought about the future uh, any comments on that and then we will open it up for questions Oh, Lakshmi. I think the the big point that you made there is something that I also deeply, deeply struggle with every day, many times during the day, which is the situations are what they are, and it's up to each of us to make a choice of whether we succumb to that situation or whether we work against it with the help of others and do something about it. And and what I've seen in this book is most of the people have made a choice to work to make something change. whenever they were faced with situations that pushed them the other way uh, and i've looked at those two situations with the nawab of hyderabad and the successors of gorangizit where they also chose something but they didn't choose something that left a legacy uh, and i think for me this book is a is a reminder in fact i i read some chapters or some parts of it as often as i can every uh, uh, even after it's been published just to remind me that every time i have a choice uh some parts of the book like the chapter on aurangzeb and the nawab and uh, of hyderabad was written when i was going through a lot of personal challenges at home in the last two three years uh, and every time as i wrote something i said hey i sh- i'm also making a choice here or whether i succumb and say look this is I-, i can play the victim card which is such an easy way out and it's such a self fulfilling way to just say oh the world is against me and everything is going bad and nothing will work right and it makes me feel very good but when i hear these stories or read these stories or i talk to other people uh i'm reminded that i have to make a choice and there's no right or wrong i mean a choice is a choice and i find like stories like sarfoji the second a uh, phenomenal choice that he made that he could have lived his life in leisure and you know wine women and song which were the vices of those days but he chose to do all the remarkable things that he did in terms of health education and art and literature so lakshmi short answer to your to your very very uh the wise question is uh, is at the end of the day it's all about choice for all of us at every moment of our lives yeah the choices that we make yeah absolutely right i think that this another quote that i, I would uh, just like to mention so i think it was uh, k s narayan the founder of india sevens father of mr shankar and kumar of the sanmar group uh in one of the talks i think he mentioned uh, all of you have great degrees etc he says i've got a degree in people now oh, it's such a profound statement you know it, it's all about people understanding people uh getting them uh, working with them to realize their individual potential to show them the values to bring about behavioral changes through values and belief changes etc it's it's that people uh that is that is embodied in the book historic people that is there so very well put at this point we'll conclude and wait for your comment and i'll read one last question that has come from ram krishnan kalyan raman and then you can give your comments and then we'll have some closing remarks from sri garapati also Ra- ramki asks in the historical period under review and earlier and perhaps immediately later weller and spirit of adventure effectively meant discovery of new lands and conquest in this time and age is that manifesting in more economic business dimensions of capturing markets market share and hence perhaps little underwhelming from width of impact and distribution of wealth that's the question essentially i think he is he is saying the battles that were fought there was fought then was for territory is uh, effectively the same battle being fought here for various states through electoral battles is that what you are saying ramki go ahead pradeep and i it's not just the territory right it's the wealth that comes with the territory when we talking about territory we're also talking about income through tolls taxes and and uh, and agri and uh, agricultural income as well so it's always about the economy more than anything else um, if i had taken a chapter say on the cholas i would have actually gone into a lot of details with the numbers and everything but that will come for another book but uh, i would just like to tell mr ramkrishna kalyan raman that all of these were not just about territory territory was actually one part of it it was about uh, it was about the connotation of what is powerful but along with that territory came the wealth that the territory that accrued from the territory as well 
very very much and if you look at ahale bai holkar's case we were talking about it uh, of how she encouraged traders to come in and and uh, work with her so in every case you will find um, uh, that uh, that situation coming through and orangzeb didn't do much of it he focused a lot more on fighting for the territory and not looking at the building of the business and the industry and that proved the our undoing which is that within for an empire that he worked so hard to create 22 years after he died the empire that was larger than what india is today and almost it shrunk to what is smaller than neighbor delhi today so economy and the capital and the money was very very important for them just as much as it is important for us today great sri your comments anything otherwise i just have yeah one i mean yeah, yeah I just uh, just what yeah just just very quickly just one more common theme i think i'd like to i mean you know as i was reading through these chapters i was thinking you know the the europeans really had an edge on our indian kings to the uh, 18th century or the 19th century because of the industrial revolution and the innovation and the weapons that they uh, you know discovered and introduced and they had superior uh, uh, power and that sort of really uh, you know uh, changed a lot uh, of how india shaped up the east india company and all that after that you know i was just thinking uh, relating it to the current uh, what's happening in the world today right i mean technology is evolving so fast things are changing so fast and all of us uh, in our businesses are thinking about how do we adapt to this change how do we adapt to this new technology and the changes that are likely to happen so we need to be prepared to take on these uh, challenges and uh, and uh, technology is going to disrupt uh, you know a lot of uh, industry sectors uh, in the next uh, few decades so we all need to be prepared so that was another uh, interesting learning for me and i was just thinking why with all the wealth that we had we couldn't match up to the to the british or the french or the east india company <laughs> and we had to give up our freedom so that's another fascinating very fact. very interesting point very nice point i think i'll just uh read one passage which uh, pradeep has put in his book very telling this is again going back to jahanara uh this is what's inscribed on jahanara's tomb it's a simple and yet elegant elegant marble enclosure with a tombstone that carries our own verse he is the living the sustaining there cannot be any other curtain of my tomb except the humble covering of grass grass alone is sufficient to cover the grave of a poor person as i am disciple of the khwaja mainuddin kisti daughter of shah jahan the conqueror may allah eliminate his proof a uh, epitaph expresses a wish for a grave to be covered with grass like any other ordinary grave ironically this wish came from the first lady of the empire in choosing not to occupy the center stage but yet make a mark jahanara inspires us even today oh, it's very greatly put thank you prathi thank you for this book with that we conclude the formal session of leadership shastra a book by prathi chakravarti now oh, thank you and over to you chandramol thank you very much pradeep and thank you very much uh, lakshmi and uh, shri for that very very interesting uh, discussion on the book and i would i would just like to point out one more feature which uh, probably has been missed out and that is how to use the book pradeep goes on to tell us that uh, use the book as a sadhana and use the book to examine your own beliefs and later alter your behavior i think that is something which i thought it's more of a practical workbook kind of a thing not simply a narration of uh, history and that is where he connects history to uh, present day life and present day uh, leadership i think that's fascinating for me and with that we come to the end of this session and uh, thank you all for uh joining us today as we discuss this book and we'll come back to you with much more um, many more such conversations many more such discussions and i'm sure you would be there to support us uh, we wish you a very very pleasant evening and uh, till we meet again thank you again yeah thank you very much thank you thank you pradeep thank you thank you sir thank you pradeep